Hi everyone, this is Kalyan Kumar and welcome to Chemistry Tutorials. In this particular video, we are talking about Atomic Structure Part 12A of 13, which is the introduction to quantum mechanics. Now, it's been almost two weeks since I made my last video on Heisenberg's uncertainty principle because it has taken me that much amount of time to create content for this video. Though initially I wanted to make one single video on quantum mechanics, especially the Schrodinger wave equation, I realized later on that the content was so much and that the content had to be presented in a way that you would appreciate quantum mechanics. So I made it into, I'm probably going to make it into two or three parts. This is 12A, the first part of quantum mechanics, which is aptly named as Introduction to Quantum Mechanics. So I'm going to talk about more of a philosophical view of quantum mechanics. Remember, uh, we are talking about quantum mechanics from the point of view of grade 11 or class 11. And therefore, we're not going to go into the quantitative aspects. We're only going to look at the qualitative aspects. And in fact, I'm not even going to talk about the Schrodinger wave equation in this particular video. I'm just going to talk about what quantum mechanics means and how quantum mechanics is related to classical mechanics. How does it differ and how do they both merge into each other? To start the discussion, we need to go back to the problems that we experience in the Bohr's atomic theory. Now, the Bohr theory of the atom is able to account for certain experimental data, especially the Rydberg's equation, in a convincing manner, but it has a number of severe limitations. And we are just going to talk about those limitations, though we discuss these limitations when we discuss the Bohr's theory, but I'm going to bring them back here because these are contextual to quantum mechanics. While the Bohr theory correctly predicts the spectral series of hydrogen, hydrogen isotopes and hydrogenic atoms. And by hydrogenic atoms, I'm talking about ions which have single electrons, like for example, lithium plus and, 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 and similar types of ions. It is incapable of being extended to treat the spectra of complex atoms having two or more electrons. We discussed that because the potential energy that Bohr used was simply the attractive force of the electron with the nucleus. Whereas if you want to actually look at a multi-electron system, the potential energy of the electron will also be including the repulsion the electrons feel amongst themselves. So Bohr could not account for that and therefore his theory doesn't work for complex atoms. Now initially it could not give any reason, any explanation as to why certain spectral lines are more intense than others. That is, why certain transitions between energy levels have a greater probability of occurrence. But later on, the quantum mechanics itself was able to give an idea as to why this actually happens. This happens primarily because, uh, I think I have a red color, yeah. It primarily happens because, let's say the electron is in level 4. And let us say you have four atoms. Now, law of probability says that each atom can come in its own particular way. And according to probability theory, all the ways of coming to the ground state should be seen. And they are equally probable. Because there are four ways of coming from four to one. One is four to one direct. The other is four to two, then two to one. Then you have 4 to 3 and 3 to 1 direct. Then you have 4 to 3, 3 to 2 and 2 to 1. Now, so law of probability says since the probability of the occurrence of each way is 1 by 4, because there are four ways of coming, so they have all have equal probabilities. So if we have a certain set of atoms, then we should find equally probable all these transitions. But if you notice, 2 to 1 occurs in two of those probabilities. So four to one is shown only by one atom, which means four to one transition has a probability of one by four. Now, but if you look at four to three, you can see in two of them. So four to three has a possibility probability of two into one by four. Whereas if you look at 4 to 3, only this atom comes from 4 to 3 directly. So, so uh, sorry, I think this was uh, 4 to 3. I'm talking about 4 to 2. 4 to 2 
is only seen in this atom and therefore its probability is again 1 by 4. And if you look at 3 to 2, this is the only atom which comes from 3 to 2. So 3 to 2 is also having a probability of 1 by 4. So if you look at this and 2 to 1 of course, we missed out 2 to 1. 2 to 1 also occurs twice. So the probability is 2 into 1 by 4. So if you look at these values, you will notice that not all transitions have equal probabilities. So, and as we will find out, quantum mechanics is all about probabilities. So according to quantum mechanics, this is the reason why certain lines have greater intensity than others. But of course, Niel Bohr could not really point a finger to this. So that was one of the problems with the Bohr model. Uh, it cannot account for the observation that many spectral lines actually consist of several separate lines whose wavelength differ slightly. And more importantly, it does not permit us to obtain what a really successful theory of the atom should make possible. That is an understanding of how individual atoms interact with one another to endow the macroscopic aggregates of matter with the physical and chemical properties we observe. For example, uh, assuming the electron like a particle, which was what uh, Neil Bohr assumed it to be, at least in the beginning, and most of his theory is based on that, you would notice that we, in, in chemical bonding, we use the valence bond theory. But later on, we talked about the molecular orbital theory, and the molecular orbital theory is an outcome of quantum mechanics. So, the duality of the electron as a wave and a particle is fundamental to the understanding of an atom. And Bohr's theory could not account for many of these uh, observations mainly because it treated the electron like a particle. Now, but uh, one thing that we need to understand that these objections to the Bohr theory are not put forward in an unfriendly way or criticizing the, the model for the theory was one of the most seminal and pivotal achievements in understanding the structure of the atom. But rather, this uh, list of uh, things which Bohr could not explain have been put forward to emphasize that a more radical approach or more comprehensive approach is required to understand the atomic phenomena and we need greater generality uh, in, in this particular explanation. And such a theory was conceived and developed between 1925 and 26 by Erwin Schrodinger, Werner Heisenberg and others by the name of quantum mechanics. So this is Mr. Erwin Schrodinger, who is one of the pioneers in developing quantum mechanics, which is known as which particular thing is known as the Schrodinger's wave equation. Now, by the early 1930s, the application of quantum mechanics to problems involving nuclei, atoms, molecules, and matter in the solid state made it possible to understand a vast body of otherwise puzzling data leading to predictions of remarkable accuracy. For example, if you look at chemical bonding, we find in many ions and atoms bonds which are neither a single bond or a double bond, they are in between the two, which of course was later on explained by a phenomenon called resonance. But resonance is actually a, a, a convenient way of trying to uh, inculcate quantum mechanics. So it is finally quantum mechanics which was able to explain many of the puzzling data. Uh, especially in the case of uh, polyelectronic atoms and molecules. Now, the fundamental difference between classical or Newtonian mechanics and quantum mechanics lies in what it is that they describe. And this is very, very important to understand. Newtonian mechanics is concerned with the motion of a particle under the influence of applied forces and it takes for granted that such quantities as the particle's position, mass, velocity, acceleration, etc. can be measured. So Newtonian mechanics assumes that everything can be measured. All physical quantities can be measured. Now this assumption is of course completely valid in our everyday experience and Newtonian mechanics provides the correct explanation for the behavior of moving bodies in the sense that the values it predicts for observable magnitudes agree with the measured values of these magnitudes. So in Newtonian mechanics, if you throw a ball and you 
talk about the initial velocity the acceleration uh, 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 and perhaps the distance you will be able to find the final velocity and the value calculated would be very very close to the experimental values now quantum mechanics 2 consists of relationships between observable magnitudes but the uncertainty principle comes in the way of radically altering the definition of what is observable magnitude in the atomic realm. According to the uncertainty principle which we have discussed in the last video, you can go out and check it. The position and momentum of a particle cannot be accurately measured at the same time. While in Newtonian mechanics, both are assumed to have a definite, ascertainable values at every instant. The quantities whose relationship quantum mechanics explores are probabilities. So quantum mechanics is probabilistic and Newtonian mechanics is deterministic. So Newtonian mechanics says this is the value and quantum mechanics says the probable value is this or the probability of this value is this. For example, instead of asserting that the radius of the electron's orbit in the ground state of hydrogen atom is exactly 5.3 into 10 to the power negative 11 meters, quantum mechanics says that this is the most probable radius. If we conduct a suitable number of experiments, and I mean large number of experiments, several trials will yield a different value, either larger than or smaller than this value, but the single value that most often would occur is 5.3 into 10 to the power negative 11 meters. Now, what I'm basically trying to say is, uh, it is said that if a coin is unbiased, if a coin does not have any uh, inkling towards a head or a tail, if you toss an unbiased coin, the probability of getting a head is 1 by 2 and the probability of getting a tail is 1 by 2. But it is possible that I toss the coin three times and I may get heads three times. Now, one may argue that what is the point of probability if in reality I am getting three times heads? So what is the point in saying that the, uh, the, the probability of getting a head or a tail is equal? Well, the probability works only when you consider large number of experiments. If I were to toss the coin one million times, then the number of heads and tails that I would get would almost be equal. They may not be exactly equal, but they would be almost be equal. Now let me toss them 10 million times. Then the number of heads and the tails would approach exact half value as you keep on increasing the number of experiments. So please understand that when we calculate the radius of a hydrogen atom, what quantum mechanics says is that more the number of trials you do, more probability you will get 5.3 into 10 to the power negative 11 and it doesn't mean every time you're going to get that. So the single value that most often repeats itself is 5.3 into 10 to the power negative 11 meters. Now it might be felt at first glance that quantum mechanics is the poor substitute for Newtonian mechanics. But a detailed analysis would reveal a striking fact that Newtonian mechanics is nothing but an approximation version of quantum mechanics. The certainties proclaimed by Newtonian mechanics are actually illusory and their agreement with experimental values is a consequence of the fact that macroscopic bodies consist of so many individual atoms that departure from the most probable behavior are unnoticeable. What I'm basically trying to say is that if we have, let us say, a value that we are measuring as 0 0.0000001. Now this is a value that is expected. And I guess 0 0.00000, how many zeros are there? Six of them, 0, 2. Now you would notice a difference here. And this is almost a 50% jump. But if this value were 100, 0.00000001 and 100.00000002 this is such a small difference that you will not be able to notice it. So what we are saying is for macro objects the differences do occur 
between the value determined and the value expected but this difference is going to be so small because they are macromolecules that the difference goes uh, i mean the, 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 the particular difference is not noticeable at all it is unnoticeable whereas for smaller values smaller the values are bigger is the jump in terms or bigger is the difference between what is expected and what is finally there and therefore the quantum mechanics merges with newtonian mechanics when you look for macroscopic objects but remember quantum mechanics works even for macroscopic objects only the difference is that whatever quantum mechanics predicts they are not noticeable if you were able to notice that then quantum mechanics will work perfectly well with macroscopic objects also so quantum mechanics and newtonian mechanics merge for macroscopic objects in quantum mechanics the variable quantity characterizing the de broglie waves which is sometimes wrongly written as matter waves and i have in fact spoken about this uh, in my de broglie wave video is called a wave function denoted by the symbol psi it's pronounced as psi and the p is silent so it's psi now remember what quantum mechanics does is it looks into de broglie waves de broglie de broglie said even matters have wave associated with it now some books wrongly write it as matter waves matter waves are actually waves which require a matter to move like sound and the waves of water but what people refer to as matter waves when they talk about de broglie waves is the wave nature associated with matter the wave nature of matter so i'm not going to call them as matter waves i'm going to call them as de broglie waves to make it more clear so in quantum mechanics the variable quantity which characterizes the de broglie waves which uh, is a representation of de broglie waves is nothing but the wave function denoted by the symbol psi greek letter psi pronounced with p as silent so this wave function also known as amplitude function is the one that represents the wave nature of matter as predicted by de broglie the value of the wave function associated with a moving body at the particular point x y z in space at the time t is related to the likelihood of finding the body there at that time so what this wave function simply does is that the wave function at any point t with coordinates x y z tells you how much is the likelihood of finding the body there now i'm not saying wave function is directly the value of the probability what i'm saying is it is related to probability the wave function is going to give you some information about the likelihood of finding the body there at the time but it's not directly equal to it now the wave function psi itself actually has no direct physical significance for matter for waves the psi or what is generally known as y you know this y is equal to some particular wave function a cos omega t stuff like that which you will study in uh, uh, in 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 the topic waves in physics basically this y is the psi here this y is basically the amplitude of a wave so there it has a physical significance whereas here psi wave the amplitude of the wave associated with a particle it does not have any physical significance as such this is because the probability of finding something anywhere lies between only 0 and 1 and any intermediate probability let's say 0.2 it means the 20% chance of finding the object is there so probability is only positive and it lies between 0 and 1 but psi which represents amplitude and which is in fact related to the probability because amplitude is basically related to probability of finding the object at a given place in time can be negative as well you have the crest and you do the trough so you have the uh, the valleys and you have the peaks but the probability cannot be negative see psi can be negative 
if it is negative amplitude if it is going below the x axis is negative the psi can get both positive and negative values but remember probability cannot be therefore the psi is not directly the probability of finding the object there therefore psi by itself for a particle is not an observable quantity this objection of course does not apply to psi mod square the squared of the absolute value of the wave function now let me just make you understand why it is psi mod square basically what happens is irrespective if suppose psi is a real number let's say 4 or in fact let's not say 4 let's say psi is 0.2 and psi is negative 0.2 it can take both values positive and negative so what is psi square in both instances it is 0.04 it's positive so psi square will always be positive so that is one, that is one reason why we square it now why the mod because psi can also be a complex number now for those of you who are in grade 11 you may not understand what are complex numbers So wait for a while, and you'll understand complex numbers when it is being taught to you in mathematics. But for the time being, it would suffice to say that they are of the form a plus i b, where a and b are real numbers, and i is the square root of negative one. It's an imaginary number. Remember, square root of negative one is undefined. Square root of one is one itself. What is the square root of minus one? What are the two quantities? Which were multiplied will give you negative one. None that there cannot be any real value like that. So we call this as an imaginary number. So psi can be a complex number. Now what does mod psi reflect? Mod psi is equal to root of a square plus b square. Remember, psi may be complex. Psi may have an imaginary part, but psi square, which represents the probability. uh the probability psi square represents probability now this cannot have a imaginary value it has to be real so psi mod is root of a square plus b square so what is psi mod square equal to it is a square plus b square which is real so the reason we say this represents probability and not simply psi square because this reduces to psi square if psi is real but it would have to be a mod psi square if it is imaginary if it has an imaginary value in it or you can also write mod psi square for an imaginary uh, psi to be psi into psi star psi star is supposed to be the conjugate of psi which is a minus ib so if psi is a plus ib then psi star is a minus ib this is called complex conjugate so what happens when you multiply psi and psi star well a gets multiplied by a a square a gets multiplied by ib to give you plus a ib and minus ib gets multiplied by a we give you minus a ib they get cut then minus ib and plus ib gives you minus i square b square and i is root of minus 1 so what is i square equal to negative 1 put negative 1 as i square and this becomes a square plus b square so basically this is what we get so mod psi square would be simply psi square if it is real and it will be equal to psi into psi star if it has a imaginary part also so that is the reason for using mod at this point okay the this value is known as probability density psi mod square so in a nutshell the probability of experimentally finding the body described by the wave function psi at the point x y z at the time t is proportional to the value of psi square there at t so at any point of time t at coordinates x y z if the wave function is psi then the probability of finding the object at that time is psi mod square 
No, a large value of psi mod square means a strong possibility of the body's presence, while a small value means a slight probability of its presence. This interpretation is often called the Born interpretation because given by Max Born. Now, there's a big difference between probability of an event and the event itself. Now, this is something which we need to understand. Now, although the wave function psi describes a particle as being spread out in space, this does not mean that the particle itself is spread out. I mean, electron is not spread out in space. Now, one may say, then why the hell do you talk about psi? Why the hell do you talk about a wave function to describe an electron in a hydrogen atom? Because that's what we do. That's what we're going to talk about in the Schrodinger's wave equation in the next part. So, although the wave function psi describes a particle as being spread out in space, it actually doesn't mean that the particle is spread out. What it does is that when an experiment is performed to detect electrons, a whole electron is either found at a certain time and place or it is not. See, when you do an experiment to detect where the electron is at a particular point, it would either be there or it would not be there. There is no such thing as 20% of an electron. But it is entirely possible that the chance of finding the electron at that point could be 20%. And therefore, psi mod square is referring to only the probability. But actually finding the electron there or not is not related to probability in the sense that if it is 20% possible to find the electron there, then it only means that if you do the event millions and millions of times, then 20% of the times you're going to find the electron there and 80% of the time you're not going to find the electron there. It does not mean that the electron is only 20% there and spread over a larger volume. No, electron is at one point. Only thing is, we can only look at probabilities of finding the electron at a particular place in time and a particular coordinate. Now, one of the beautiful way of describing this, which at the first glance would look really confusing, is what was stated by Bragg. W. H. Bragg, the pioneer of X-ray diffraction, the equations given on X-ray diffraction, gave this loose but vivid interpretation. Now, according to him, the dividing line between the wave and particle nature of matter and radiation for that matter is the moment now. As this moment steadily advances through time, it coagulates a wavy future into a particle past. Everything in the future is a wave. Everything in the past is a particle. Looks pretty confusing. But I'll just explain what I mean by that. Let us say this is time. Increasing time. Okay. So this is the point which is called now. This is the now moment. Now, what happens is that if you want to know where the electron is in the future, that is beyond now, it is described by the wave function psi and mod psi square is going to tell you the probability. So here it's a wavy future described by wave. But remember in the past, Whenever you wanted to determine the electron, since it is past, you must have already determined where the electron is. Now remember, if this was now, then the probability, then the um, then if you want to find the electron in this space, since this is the future, again it will be represented by, by, by psi and psi mod square. But the point is, once this time has been traveled, once we reach at this point of time. Now, in this space, we must have found the electron somewhere. The moment you find the electron somewhere, it's a particle. Say, for example, you look at every amount of space in the atom and you say, oh, I got the electron standing here. The moment you find the electron standing at that particular point of time, it's a particle. So everything before now, the electron is a particle. Everything after now, is only going to be described by wave because you don't know where the electron is. All you can talk about is the probability of finding the electron. So everything in the future is a wave. Everything in the past is a particle. And the beautiful part, as the dividing line between the wave and particle nature of matter and radiation is the moment now. So everything is defined by now. 
at the moment after now we don't know where the electron is we can only talk about probability its wave but before that we've already determined where the electron was and now that part when we determine the electron wherever it was it's a particle so as oh we got to get this back so the dividing line between the wave and particle nature of the matter is the radiation is the moment now as this moment steadily advances through time it coagulates or precipitates a wavy future into a particle past so what happens is as time goes by the wave thing collapses and becomes a particle and as you keep moving forward everything in the future can only be determined by wave function and probability uh, psi mod square but everything in the past has already been determined you've already determined where the electron was and there it is a particle then and all of this in quantum mechanics was uh, comprehensively put in what is known as the copenhagen interpretation because neil bohr was working in his institute in copenhagen and werner heisenberg was his assistant so the copenhagen interpretation is an expression of the meaning of quantum mechanics that was largely devised in the years 1925 to 27 by neil bohr and werner heisenberg it remains one of the most commonly taught interpretation of quantum mechanics so remember the quantum mechanics has some basic fundamental rules and principles which is what we're going to talk about in the copenhagen interpretation the following points illustrate the basic principles and the nature of quantum mechanics based on the copenhagen interpretation so this is the copenhagen interpretation and this is the interpretation of quantum mechanics so whatever you have done so far this is the final uh final final points final set of points that describe everything we have done so far a wave function psi represents the state of the system we know that it encapsulates everything that can be known about that system before an observation there is no additional hidden parameters the wave function evolves smoothly in time while get being isolated from other systems so we are talking about independent atoms independent electrons now the probably the, the properties of the system are subject to a principle of incompatibility that means certain set of properties cannot be jointly defined for the same system at the same time this incompatibility is expressed quantitatively by heisenberg's uncertainty principle for example if a particle at a particular instant has a definite location it's meaningless to speak about its momentum at that instant so quantum mechanics says that there are set of properties which cannot be jointly defined at a particular for a particular system at a particular coordinate at a particular point in time now during an observation and this is very very crucial and this in fact we've discussed before in what is known as the observer effect during an observation the system would interact with a laboratory device when the device makes a measurement the wave function of the systems is set to collapse or irreversibly reduced to an eigen state of the observable that is registered now let me explain this very complicated statement what we are basically saying is if you just go back to the heisenberg's uncertainty principle video that i made that is part 11 you will notice there's a particular video called dr dr quantum and in that it clearly illustrates how an electron behaves differently when it is being detected and not being detected so i'm just going to show you a little diagram but you can go back and see the video it will be much better doing that but right now i'm just going to give you an idea what i'm basically giving you an idea is that uh, there is a interference experiment called the young's double slit experiment now what this experiment basically does is there are two slits and there is a screen at the back now if you were to fire particles a, a particle gun fires particles then some particles will move through this hole and reach here some particles will move through this hole and reach here and you will get two patches of particles and some few particles may go here and here because they may hit the corner of the uh, hole and go and hit here but they will be very few in number whereas 
If you look at a wave, wave behaves differently. If you have a wave coming out here, like this, like this, like this, what happens is that when the wave comes here, it goes through both slits and starts interfering with one another. Both slits give out waves and these waves in interfere and the interference pattern that you observe the interference pattern that you observe is kind of like this uh, small ones, big ones, big ones and then going down, down, down so something like this and um, of course this is not drawn to scale or anything the maximum point you generally get is here at the slit center so basically waves behave like this when they did the same experiment with electrons they found it to behave like waves so you fire electrons ideally electrons are particles and they should just give me two patches here but even electrons give me a patch like this just like light just like a wave so that's why we talked about duality of uh, matter both particle and wave. Now the fact of the matter is that people said, okay, how is it possible that a single electron goes? Now, of course, initially they thought electrons are colliding with each other to give you this effect. Then they starting firing electron one by one. Single electron fired, after some time another electron fired, after some time another electron fired. And what they found out was that still they got the same interference pattern. Which means, now interference can only be had if two waves interact. There's a wave coming here, there's a wave coming here and they will interfere with each other. So they said when a single electron is going, the only way to get this is that as if it splits itself into two parts or rather its wave part is getting split into two just like a wave and interacting with each other. So is it that the electron is going through both? So to measure that, what they did was they put a detector here. The moment they put a detector, what they found was that the electron suddenly seemed to know that there's a detector, stopped behaving like a wave and started behaving like a particle. So what essentially happened was, the moment you put a detector, you got two patches, one here and one here, just like particle. So you put the detector here, you put the detector here, you put the detector in both places. And the reason they wanted to put the detector is to know from which particular hole is it going. So first they put the detector in both places to check whether both detectors are going to detect the electron. Well, no, it went either through here or through here. Then they removed one detector and thought, okay, we'll just put a single detector and check whether it is going through this hole or not. Again, behave like a particle. When they removed both detectors, it started again behaving like a wave. Then they did something more clever. They said, okay, I'll put the detector here, but I will not connect this detector to its power plug. So if the electron is only physically seeing the detector, then it will still behave like a particle, but electron is smarter. The moment you do not connect this to a power source, it actually implies that the detector is not working in the experiment. It is only physically present. It is not doing any act of detecting electron went back to behaving like a wave. So when you try to detect, it becomes a particle. When you don't detect, it behaves like a wave. And this is called the observer effect. And this is the third point in the Copenhagen interpretation. During an observation, the system would interact with a laboratory device. When the device makes a measurement, the wave function of the system is set to collapse. That means instead of being a wave, it starts becoming like a particle or irreversibly reduces to a one eigenstate. Now, eigenstate is something which we will introduce when we talk about uh, the uh, Schrodinger wave equation. But eigenstate basically is, uh, I'll just give you an idea. Psi is a wave function. And when you solve, when you see the equation of psi, and you will find that it has infinite values. But only some values are meaningful. And those meaningful values are called eigenstates. And we only look at those meaningful values. Some values are not meaningful, we will reject them. So these meaningful values are eigenstate. So basically what we are saying is the moment you put a detect, a, a, any kind of a detector, it irreversibly reduces to an eigenstate. That means it will go to one of the state 
of the observable that is registered so either it behave like this or like this as if it is a particle the next point is that the results provided by measuring devices are essentially classical and should be described in ordinary language so whenever you detect something whenever you measure something it will be the result like a classical mechanic value so if you are able to get the exact momentum it will be just like a momentum of a cricket ball or a baseball if you try to measure the exact position it will be just like you are measuring in classical mechanics the position of a ball so whatever measuring devices you use and whatever is the observed value the observed value would be essentially classical in nature now the description given by wave function is probabilistic and this principle as we initially said is the born rule that means remember the wave function itself is not probable uh, it's not itself is not uh, it's not going to give you the probabilistic value but what it would do is it itself is not the probability its square is the probability the mod square but it is related to probability now the wave function expresses a necessary and fundamental wave particle duality this should be reflected in ordinary language accounts of experiments now remember an experiment can only reveal an electron to be like a particle or a wave it cannot do both according to neil bohr he said whenever you design an experiment it can only detect the electron like a particle or like a wave it will only do one of these so if you do a interference thing it will behave like a wave if you do something like a photoelectric effect it will behave like a particle so it will only do one thing at a time duality cannot be observed in a single experiment now the inner workings of atomic and subatomic processes are necessarily and essentially inaccessible to observation because the very act of observing them would greatly affect them again the observer effect so he says you can't go into an atom and start looking at things because the very act of looking would change things and lastly when quantum numbers are large they refer to properties which closely match those of classical description this is the correspondence principle of bohr and heisenberg what it basically does if you remember the hydrogen atom given by bohr initially you will find level 1 level 2 level 3 now basically classical mechanics says the electron should go into an orbit circular orbit it could take any orbit is what bohr who introduced the quantum nature and said it can only go to specific orbits where mv r is nh by 2 pi the first instant of the use of quantum mechanics now what happens is uh, if you remember the bohr's theory the difference between 1 and 2 is much greater than even 2 and infinity so what it basically means is as you go up 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 you will find that the distance between the energy levels is narrowing so just imagine Uh, uh, let me say infinity is one thousand. So the gap between nine 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 and one thousand is going to be so small. Nine nine eight and nine 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 will be so small that what you can expect is after a certain value of n, you would not have discrete levels. You will have a band. So you'll have continuous radiations here. So that means when the n value increases. you get a continuous radiation when the n value is low you get discrete so quantum mechanics works when n values are low that's where the quantum thing is workable for higher values of n the quantum reduces to the classical one which expects continuous radiation from an atom so that was the basic introduction to quantum mechanics we talked about a lot of philosophy here we talked about a lot of uh, uh, how quantum mechanics and classical mechanics differ and how do they merge for higher values of n we talked about the copenhagen interpretation uh, so this was the basic uh, idea about quantum mechanics it's not quantum mechanics in its entirety because we got a lot of ground to cover and perhaps the next few uh, videos would help you that in the next video we will be talking about wave equation in general what is the basic wave equation and that would help us understand what is the schrodinger wave equation so with that we end this particular video i hope you enjoyed this video and understood the basic 
principles of quantum mechanics if you have any questions any queries any doubts anything that you would like to comment on please drop them in the comment section below if you haven't subscribed to my channel please do so immediately the idea is i'm going to make lots and lots of more videos like this we are just starting off we have done solid state we are doing atomic structure i'm going to do each and every lesson of chemistry for grade 11 and 12 so if you haven't subscribed to it subscribe to it quickly so that you can get a notification the moment i post a video and you'll get a separate panel on your youtube channel on the left side where all your subscribe channels will be listed you can reach my channel just by clicking on my channel so you won't have to search for these videos you'll be able to access them very easily and if you like this video, please press the thumbs up button. This is Kalyan Kumar signing off. Have a great day. Goodbye and thank you for watching.